Now, I wanted to be posh when I started this. Um, I know our producer clarified how to say your name, but is this how do you say? Is this how you'd say your name in Farsi? Thabeti. So it's Doctor Pardis Thabeti. Uh, it, if it was in Persian, it would be Pardis Sabeti. Here you go. But you know, but that's not it's not natural to say. So Pardis Sabeti is kind of the Americanized version. Well, we're here with Doctor Pardis Sabeti. Thank you for coming on to the show. Um, you're out in New York. Martin's out in New York. I'm here in London, and you've been described as a rock star in the world of science. How does that feel? Um, it's nice. Obviously, I don't. I appreciate both appreciate it, but also don't take it too seriously. It's, um, it's uh, yeah. People say a lot of things. Doesn't doesn't. It's, I mean, uh, I was just yeah. listening to your tunes well, on Spotify. Yeah, man. For those of you who don't know, Doctor Pardis is uh, in a band called A Thousand Days. I was just having a little listen, having a boogie <laughs> in the studio, and yeah, it's a vibe, man. Breathing. Okay. Everyone, yeah. check out breathing. Okay. Right. How often do you get scientists slash singers, man? This is amazing. Oh, well, thank you. Well, that's that's particularly nice, obviously, coming from you. Um, you know, and I, I enjoy it. I enjoy it. I, I can't sing like you do. <laughs> you There's a lot of branches uh, to your kind of title and expertise. Before we move any further, I'd just like to know, what would you describe your role as and for who? Um, I would say I'm a, uh, that I'm uh, what, you, you, what you might call a computational geneticist. Um, but that has to have a, that does a lot of the genetics part of the computation as well. So we um, we mine the genomes of humans and other organisms looking for patterns. Um, and and we now we all, we now kind of all collectively know there's a lot that comes with that. That's like it's much bigger than just studying the genomes. That 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 relates to everything we do in medicine, from diagnostics to vaccines and therapies. It's all connected to the genome of organisms. And mm-hmm. so so that's what we do. We really are trying to mine the genomes of humans and other organisms, but in order to do that, we develop a lot of technologies to make that possible. So a lot of bioengineering happening um, um, and other kinds of work as well. Can you break that down for me? So if you were to, if you're mining a human DNA, what are we talking about? Getting a strand of hair and looking at what what's in it? What do yeah. you mean by that? Um, so uh, probably like one of my earliest big things, like what I did in my PhD work was... Um, developing methods like tests to take uh, a whole bunch of samples of humans, uh, a group of samples from humans, and look for mutations that are biologically important or meaningful. And what was kind of cool about that work is even when in early days we didn't have much data, so we might have like uh-huh. 100, 100 Europeans total. But even within those 100 Europeans total, if you analyze the data in the kind of the right ways, you can identify all sorts of biologically important things. Um, there's these footprints that are left behind. There's these patterns that you can find in DNA that will tell you something important is happening here. Um, and so we, I developed this method that allows you to detect, um, ain't like uh, recent, but but recent is pretty ancient. Like within the last few thousand years, mm-hmm. mutations that emerged in humans that were uh, beneficial to their survival. Mm-hmm. So things that allowed them to like uh, resist infectious disease or survive new environments or diets. Uh, we could just go through and there's like this telltale signal uh, you can pick up that tells you that this mutation is actually really important. And then we did a lot of investigative work to figure out what those were. And in one example of those, um, uh, when we were looking in a large population from, um, or like, sorry, in hundred samples from a population in Nigeria, the strongest signal we found was uh, connected to resistance to a virus called Lassa virus. And mm-hmm. that ended up starting a whole nother path in my career where I was like, what, what is this virus and why does, what, what could be going on here? And before you know it, you're, you're seeing that these viruses are, um, I started sleuthing and seeing that these viruses are probably, um, uh, around and infecting us at a lot higher levels than we think. Um, so there, there's a whole lot to it, but you're just, you're basically, you're looking for patterns that tell you mutations are important and those and those mutations then tell you things that are biologically meaningful or historically meaningful. It sounds very Darwinian to put it in, in simple terms, right? The survival of the fittest, that you look at data in a, in, in a genome and there's kind of, I guess, two ways you look at it. One is you're looking retrospectively at a sample range of people and saying, mm-hmm. oh, these things are in common. Now, what could they be attributed to in terms of their survival and, and other characteristics? I mean, whenever I try to explain what I do, I, I usually do go to the simple principle of natural selection that yeah. says the trait is beneficial to the survival or the reproductive success of someone who carries it. It's more mm-hmm. likely to be to that person's more likely to survive, reproduce, and pass it on to their children. 
And so in that kind of constant of natural selection, it's the traits that are beneficial will rise in prevalence very quickly. Um, and so in my human evolution work, my human like kind of genomics work, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying, I, there are, there's a patterns that you can use to date how old a mutation is. And then you can okay. use that to go through the genome and look for mutations that are common, that have gotten to high prevalence, but have done that very quickly. So that is actually like the, the trick we're trying to do is actually to find out how to date these mutations and figure out mutations that have beat chance. Oh, wow, um, yeah. But when you're actually studying a viral genome like SARS-CoV-2, you don't have to do that because you're seeing evolution in real time, right? You you actually mm. have the, the... So we have to do that because we don't have data from 10,000 years ago of humans. So we're trying to like... There's an art... Like tease out the archaeological record in our own DNA. Whereas when you're studying microbes, they, they evolve so quickly and they are changing so quickly and we're capturing that data in real time. You actually, all we're doing is looking for mutations that rise in prevalence. And so you probably all now like become very common, understand this, this idea of a variant of concern, mm -hmm. the UK variant, the South Africa era variant, now like the Delta variant. Delta even. variant, yeah. Uh, yeah. 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 Um, but yeah, so, so my, my lab, one of the kinds of things we do is we develop approaches to find those things. And during Ebola, we actually published on that a lot. And we got a lot of blowback. We actually published that the Ebola virus genome was evolving and that there are a number of mutations that were uh, helping it, you know, increase in transmissibility. Um, and uh, so we published a few papers on that and it got like a lot of pushback. But now, and we, and we published a paper early on with Jer all with Jeremy Lubin um, that showed that that also SARS-CoV-2 is mutating and I get a lot mm. of blowback and now everyone's like, oh, of course. Is it because no one wants to hear the bad news? Yeah, I don't know. People, it's just, it's very interesting in science how people become very like entrenched and they're like, that's not possible. Like the idea yeah. that most mutations don't matter. And so they're like, well, most mutations are either deleterious, they're not good, you throw them out mm -hmm. or, or they don't matter. So then therefore it's not changing. It's like, yeah, most mutations are like that. But if you give something a million chances, yeah. you, know, you might stumble You'll upon find something. Find this way through. I think it's just, I think people just don't like change to ideas. And, um, and so every time, and this has happened to me a lot of times in my career where it's like, I'll, I'll be talking about something that people will hate and then everybody expects, accepts it as a norm. The, where we're evolving as human beings um, <laughs> and adapting to new viruses and, and similarly, the viruses are evolving to survive as well, right? So like, oh, how quick, so you're saying, in, for, let's take, for example, COVID-19 and in all its variants now. And how quickly do you see, how how quick is that process for us to adapt to a virus and, and for that to continue? Like over what kind of time span do you see that happening? Well, I mean, so that, I mean that's the interesting thing, right? For the virus, it's very quick because it, yeah. it, it's very quickly and it's it's generation time is, there's a short generation time and a high mutation rate. So it's changing all the time. And like this thing that we're seeing now when we're talking about all the variants in, in COVID, obviously that's happening in every in every infectious disease outbreak. We've just never had the kind of data to see it before, but that's what's always happening. That's why we have to update our flu vaccines every year because mm -hmm. the thing keeps changing and evading the things we have. For us, like our broad generation time is about 25 years. And so it's going to take us a long time to catch up and and fight infections, and so you would think that they would have fully have the upper hand, um, but there's a couple of things like we have we there are things like we have what we call an adaptive immune system. Mm -hmm. Our immune system on subtle levels is changing. If we fight off a virus once, we now have adapted. We'll For change sure. parts of our um, kind of make genetic makeup to be able to be protected against it in the future and. And, and collectively, in the larger population, any virus may kill off some fraction of the human population, but we have a lot of diversity amongst ourselves. So we have other tricks we've had up our sleeves for, for many, many millennia and millions of years to like stay alive in this battle. Uh, and then more recently, you know, we have drugs and therapies and vaccines. And so now it's a little bit more, that's the more kind of competitive edge we have, where it's a fight between our therapies, our vaccines versus the generation time of the viruses and battling there. Is your job most effective when you've got, you know, a handful of years to, to, to look at uh, something that happened, let's say SARS as an example, and then to try and look at that as an experiment and then determine as you can see something, let's say there's a headwind, you can see corona coming, which often we don't see it, right, as we didn't with, with coronavirus, or at least the evidence is that there were signals, but 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 nothing really, you know, it, most 
politicians, most countries look like the response is quite late. Or is it better that you can take a highly iterative method? So I think of data, just basic data sampling and think, how good is the data when the pool is small and it's changing so quickly? Um, how effective can you be? And this probably leads to the fact that um, you know you need propagation, but you also need action. And the tech you need, otherwise you can't test. And therefore, it's better to have something like a short-term vaccine and then and, and spend money and invest and iterate than it is to do nothing. But how effective can your work be when you're right on the front line? The problem is like a lot simpler than that. Like, yes, of course, you can't predict where the next, like, you know, a spark will fly, but you can definitely put in together a good early warning system that can pick up the sparks when they fly. And that's something, with, what's kind of remarkable whenever I give talks I like, I used to hate, I, I feel like Ebola was my like one hit. I used to hate talking about <laughs> right. it, but now I've recently started to talk about it again because I think it's so relevant in mm -hmm. that it's so similar. Like literally when I tell the story of Ebola, I might as well, I could just swap in SARS or I could swap in Zika or like in most of these cases, or maybe Zika is a little bit different because it's a vector borne disease, but the general ideas are actually all still pretty much the same, whatever right. virus you're talking about. Um, and a lot of whatever microbe you're talking about in a lot of cases, um, you have to build the same, like the genomic sequencing is useful to find out what it is. Then you translate that to a diagnostic that you can roll out everywhere. Um, and then the vaccine development, like every microbe is a little bit different. Biology is a little bit different, but there's no reason you don't have to wait for something to start get, getting started. Uh, and we could create a system, pretty, pretty simple system that would have us have a huge head start over any infectious disease pretty quickly. It'd basically be the ability to Every time you identify like a weird case or a weird cluster of case, sequence it, figure out what's in there, um, and then immediately make that data available to everyone around the world. Mm -hmm. Everyone around the world should then be able to immediately actualize on that, and that didn't happen, right? So one of the things is yep. relatively we got the information about SARS-CoV-2 pretty quickly, mm -hmm. um, but then there's a long delay. I mean, the U.S., remember, like the rollout was very, very slow, but there's no reason my lab... So the the sequence came out in January. We had a working diagnostic like a week later, and we had them wow. on ground in our field sites in Nigeria, Sierra Leone, and Senegal like two weeks later. And we weren't even, I mean, that we were not mandated to do it. That was just like, that's it's just that easy to do. And yeah. so every lab in around the world could have had working diagnostics. We could have picked up cases everywhere where they identified. And now that we understand that we have technologies like mRNAs, which uh, so most therapies take a long time to develop because they're like generally targeting the protein sequence. And those are pretty unique to each virus. And they, they're like bespoke. They've got these different components to them. Whereas if you're targeting the genome sequence, it's like a code. You just type in and you can plug in anything. And so there's a, you can move a lot quick, quick, more quickly if you have something that targets the genome because it's pretty easy to swap in whatever genome you're interested in. So all that to say, we're now in the diagnostics work similarly like that too. So we're in a place where we could have a system that picks up any new threat, rolls out those diagnostics globally so we can prevent spread while we then quickly move to roll out uh, vaccines. And we should get our place, ourselves to a place where that is just how we do it. Um, a standard, but, yeah. Yeah, but but I, it, it really is going to take still a lot of political will. We, I mean, we said that after every outbreak, like, hey, we should be in a place where we can do this. And I think obviously this one has caught the world's attention in the way that previous ones have not but i i never um underestimate the ability of humans to move on uh, very quickly. yeah but also oh, it's kind of like sure. i guess on a much more superficial level do you I mean I, do you reckon that's why asia was so well prepared for it you know in terms of their reaction they're very used to outbreaks the masks were on limited movement was straight in there whereas the western world it always when we talk about ebola or like even i remember mad cow disease over here like it's just like yeah it's just this thing over there like yeah it's not gonna get here don't worry about it mate do you know yeah. what i mean and then next thing you know we're like oh my god i can't believe this is my life for the last 18 months <laughs> yeah no no there's definitely a lot of hubris uh, particularly in the united <laughs> states um to feel as if we're impenetrable and we 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 the whole thing was like, I, I just, I, I've been in it for a while, so I've known this, but I, I, it's so funny to watch all my colleagues be like, do you know we fax diagnostic results? I'm like, yeah, yeah. But that's no, the like, problem. so if you could briefly run through what your role over the last year researching the coronavirus, you touched on it briefly just now, but just to bring it all together. You know, in this particular instance, it was whatever was needed. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of one of those cases where, you know, times of quiet or when the only ones doing things were focused on a very, like, limited scale, but... When, uh, but, uh, 
in, I, well, actually, I would say probably in every outbreak, I define my role by what is it, what do I need to help the people around me? And so yeah. in Sierra Leone during the Ebola outbreak, it was like we were on the front line. We made sure they had diagnostic ability. And then when we, you know, when they started having cases, we started sequencing it and making that data available to the world to move as fast as possible with vaccines and therapies. During SARS-CoV-2, like a lot of that was covered. Everybody and their mother became a COVID researcher. Uh, in some, you know, fashion people were COVID designed. It didn't matter. Everyone was doing it. So, so it gave me a little bit more flexibility to say, okay, what still, what are the areas that, what are the challenges? And so there was some work that was just working within my own backyard, both in Africa and the United States, helping all of our sites be basically buttressed and have diagnostics and be able to move. Get, we, literally, we actually had something like, I think we had we had did a, this like wrong order where we ordered like ten thousand like N five N ninety five masks and we were, at, then all, we were doing anything you know so we were like we were a donation center to different hospitals yeah yeah five masks we were so there's like whatever is needed but as far as like my research goes probably the big things we did is we sequenced um, we 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 were like sequenced one of the like the earliest outbreaks in the United States um, in Boston that launched from. Uh, one of the key things was this biotech, uh, or I guess should say a uh, international conference that um, seemed to have seeded the outbreak in, 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 in Massachusetts. And we, we, we rolled that out. We basically were able to dissect mm -hmm. what is a super spreader event. You, the genomic data can actually show you what a super oh, wow. spreader yeah, yeah. is like and, and the impact of that and, and the hundreds of thousands of cases that can come from just like one event if you're not careful. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and so like the, that was like a lot of it was the, the sort of the genetic studies. We developed a lot of diagnostics um, and uh, we both implemented diagnostics that are out there and also um, developed developed a bunch um, and, and published on some new technology. You're basically the person that the, the when you see the politicians do their news briefing and they go, scientists have said this information. And, we, and then the next day you get a, a contrasting scientific point of view where you're the person, yeah. basically, you're t you and your team are the ones warning when all the politicians say, yeah, we can keep open for another few weeks. And then uh, scientists yeah. have warned that this is not possible, <laughs> basically. Uh, yeah, a lot of nagging, whatever, whatever you have, want to call it. But yes. I wonder how you can convert an alert warning to be better received by those that have the megaphone, with, you know, maybe government local government or in, or in, in America, we'd, you know, we'd say state government. Um, I wonder just what should we do different? What should people do different in order to make sure that alert warning is effective? And we, we don't just have to pick on, uh, you know, American politics, British politics. There's a lot of them. <laughs> yeah. You know, so that actually speaks to like, I, so I, so that was a couple of the things I did. And I, the, but a lot of the other things I was doing is actually is directly in that space. So um, a few things like, uh, what, uh, that when I was talking about the, the school in Colorado I was working with, mm -hmm. we had been building a, a system uh, during um, uh, during Ebola and all these other outbreaks we were part of. We you know became very very key to us that real time information is key and that genomics can provide a high resolution piece of information, but we actually need to have mobile apps and technologies that can. Um, move more quickly. So actually for, for the last six years, I've been touting the use of Bluetooth and contact uh, for contact tracing. And that's another one of those ones where like for a long time, people were like, no, 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 no. And then everyone's like, yeah, of course. Um, but we've been, we had been developing like Bluetooth based apps and, and other kinds of apps to have people real time share information so that they can say, Hey, I'm sick. And I got flu. You might want to get tested for flu. Um, mm -hmm. And we we're, we're piling it at, at Harvard and we're describing it as the Facebook app for outbreaks that you have to also start within a close knit community where you can like get adoption. <laughs> nice. So, right. Well, Good uh, marketing. Uh, so, um, but, but uh, during the outbreak, we, we decided to work really deeply with a school in Colorado called Colorado Mesa university. And what compelled us to work there was that um, the, they were essentially, it was a school where most of the students were first in their families to go to college or from vulnerable communities and everyone had to come back and they didn't have much testing. They didn't have the kind of deep pockets that these, um, Ivy league schools and other schools had to test everybody every other day. So they're like, we gotta be smart with what we've got. And so we have developed mobile applications and this dashboard called lookout that lets you see in real time where cases are moving. Wow. And and give that data. It's, it's super cool if you ever see it. A guy who developed it um, and his team is Ben Fry. He's amazing. Like the stuff was in Minority Report and the Hulk. And like yeah. 20 years ago, he was developing the stuff that was the future and he's still developing the future. But it's very cool because it gives 
the the person, the public health people that uh, that view of exactly what's going on. And and our our general motto in that, like Martin, to your quite point, was it, you got to put power in people's hands. I think what ends up happening during outbreaks yeah. so often is everyone is like citizens step back. The scientists and the politicians have it. Wait for us. And mm-hmm. my view is like, wait for us if it takes two weeks, like four months later. And it's like, mm-hmm. no, we're we're OK. Like you guys haven't figured it out yet. And so you have to actually bring everybody to the table and you have to like so you have to give them tools that support them. Don't that doesn't just ask them to help, but helps them. And in doing so kind of incentivizes them to share real time information that could be useful. So we kind of describe that as our empower um, component of the type of we detect viruses with different diagnostics. We connect that information using these applications and we have a lot of deep learning that underlies it and things like that. Um, and then you empower every actor by giving them the information that they need. And so that that's one big piece. And then this other piece, actually, of one of the other big activities I've been doing this past year is education. So we had during um, after Ebola and then during mumps, we started engaging with a lot of high school, middle schools. Mm-hmm. In fact, there's one particular middle school, a guy named Todd Brown. And sorry, I like to tell all the folks I work with and it's not even all of them, but I want you to know these names because it's for sure it, I do things with people. And anyway, so Todd was a, a middle school teacher in Florida. He reached out to me and had me Skype with his class and then and then kind of followed up with me and said, like, these kids really want to know about outbreaks. Like, I'm thinking about developing a curriculum to teach them about outbreaks. And from there, we actually so he did develop a two week curriculum that we advised on. And then he developed a simulation where you're simulating an outbreak amongst 200, like 13 year olds. And it was pretty remarkable when you see it there in full PPE. They like they had body teams, epi teams like they. You know, it's like the kind of the power of the children of amazes. It was definitely a power of like children amaze. Like they really got into it, um, but they didn't know how to spread the virus. Like how do you make it realistic? And so at that point, we were already developing mobile applications with Bluetooth to track viruses. So Andreas Kalubri and my group made a mobile application that spreads a virtual virus via Bluetooth, like as a game. So mm-hmm. you actually can make a fake virus that's spreading through the, the cl- and it's pretty wild. I mean, it really mimics everything that's going on. And so we've been rolling that out like in a lot of different school settings and and conferences and things like that and getting people because, right, it's hard to say like, hey, this virus could spread. You you won't actually know it until it's happening. And at that point, you go like dark. Um, yeah. So how do you actually understand the stakes without it being, you know, really that high stakes? Uh, so we basically it's called Operation Outbreak. And we made a full textbook for high schoolers. We're working with the Louisiana State um, a Department of Education who want to roll it out as a as a elective course for all 11th and 12th graders in the state of Louisiana. Um, mm. And we are partnered with Crash Course, which is an educational um, uh, YouTube channel, uh, making a full like course. And so our idea is that as we move into the times of quiet, outbreaks are really a great opportunity to learn genetics, politics, psychology, right? Everything is at play. And so we've built a whole curriculum to teach kids about, uh, and, and actually adults too, um, about the science of uh, and genomics and epidemiology and statistics and all of that stuff of outbreaks. So that if it happens again, we're like all prepared and we can all do something in that. I feel like I feel I'm safer talking to you than listening to them, if I'm being honest with you. Well, in the like, sense of yeah. like when you hear the politicians I, do their spin, I'd rather we're hearing it from you and like, right, we've taken instruction from Dr. Pardis. We're good. Okay. <laughs> What, what are you going to narrow it down to? You're going to, you're going to ask Padis whether we should be washing our hands and you know, sleeping eight hours a day and stuff like that. And- <laughs> that was my follow-up question when we were talking about time frame about uh, viruses yeah. and adaptability. I was going to say, how can I heighten my chances of surviving viruses? I, I mean, honestly, <laughs> it, it is just being healthy. It's like just <laughs> healthy. Is We don't say it enough, but it's like, it, it's so clear. Like the the more you get yourself um, set up, we, you're sleeping more and eating healthy and and one of the, the one trick I say, like, it doesn't, as it's, it's, I know it as a scientist, but everyone should know it, that eating avocado, very good, very good. Nah. Um, Fair yeah. play. My yeah, daughter hates avocado, man. I well, need to get on the yeah, avocado. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there's, there's a molecule in avocado that blocks bacteria's ability to take in glucose. So um, it kind of stops bacterial growth. So if you have a bacterial infection or if you have a viral infection that may end up, you know how, you know how you get like a, flu that ends up giving you like a cough that never goes. It's often mm-hmm. a, a virus that ends up being a bacteria. Best thing you can do is just in those states is just eat a lot of avocado and it just keeps the bacterial populations down. 
Well, I guess so the team have found their clip for the socials so, after that. You're going to say a lot of big points in this podcast, but I, I, this is the I, one that's going to go. <laughs> I was going to say, that's what we call a humdinger. Uh, and, and it really shouldn't be. But given it might be a humdinger, let's just say, for those that don't like, and I love avocado, but for those that don't love avocado... What Are you just saying that for the audience, a, yeah? I'm telling you that I'm telling you that people will want to substitute, right? If it's not avocado, what else is there? Like, do we want yeah, to put I, olive oil in there? <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. I mean, so this is, it was a paper by Russell Nutztuff and he's terrific and like a brilliant What an scientist. incredible second name. But <laughs> Yeah, Russell Nutztuff, yeah. And he, um, uh, I think it's just avocado. I don't know if it's in any other things um, right now. So I'm sure somebody will try to distill it down and, Ooh, and give yeah. it as a pill. I, I'm, I'm struggling at my ripe old age of 49 to, to not show too much excitement there and, and also to put down my investment hat because I'm thinking I would invest in that. Like um, how powerful would that be if that you had the same way? Cause it sounds like, you know, we're, we're, when we look at the outbreak, for example, you, this current outbreak of coronavirus, you've got the players, right? As you say, the politicians and you've got the, the, the who and everyone becomes scapegoat. And then as you say, the, you, they say step back everyone, we know what to do. And then, and then within that, you get the other problems of human psychology is like, you know, as time goes on, we don't trust this and they listen to the first message and then we don't listen to the next one and all that kind of stuff. And like, it sounds like in the priority stack, if, as you said, if you can have one to one, uh, like direct information from the people that are seeing this stuff first, almost like, it's like the weather channel being the person that before it gets to the telly, you're seeing the weather, right? Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And um, yeah. imagine if you were to collaborate with more like popular culture sources, do you know what I'm saying? Where you, the, your team, for example, become like a brand and people are aware that this is a, a place where you can get information from very quickly before waiting for the BBC to report it. Do you know what I mean? How powerful would that be? Yeah, no, I mean, I think that if you... Um, Definitely like that kind of that a little bit of that uh, collective action is exactly what we think is like, it's so cool. It's so powerful. You we've seen it happen, you know, where it's like people working um, that like, you know, after I think it was like the earthquake quake in Haiti, where there's a lot of people like texting yeah. for, like that stuff is really, impo- it's really impactful. It's really powerful. But the way for some reason with outbreaks, I'll tell you, I ended up writing a book called outbreak culture with a journalist named Laura Salahi. And it was all about, the fact that everyone kind of assumes that in an outbreak, well, sorry, there's two, there's an assumption. People actually get surprised to hear that people are not nice during an outbreak. Um, like in the mm. sense that they always assume that everybody's like working together. But then like the other view that you should remember is like in the movies, like they're punching each other in a yeah. grocery store for cans, right? Like there's an insidious deadly threat that's going to like weaponize your neighbor against yourself. Like, and there's a lot of money to be made and a lot of recognition to be yep. had. So, um, you know, with all of that, the paranoia, suspicion, the fear, and then the kind of like greed that comes up from it and, and sort of de- desire and envy just makes everybody nuts. And, and during Ebola, essentially, what like the folks in my lab would come back from field sites would be like, Ebola is a backdrop. Like the virus is not the story. It's like just a yeah. backdrop soap opera that's happening on set. And so ultimately, um, I think that is the part that in times of quiet where we have a hot minute, we have to like overcome when we ran those games with the kids, uh, what was fascinating is like we had so many crazy incidents that would happen in the game. Like we had the military end up shooting somebody because of something, you know, an altercation. We had people made immunity passports. This is like five years ago. Wow, yeah, they made yeah. like, immunity passports and then people like cheated on the immunity passports and all the nuts that happens happened. Yeah. Uh, but it was really cool because afterwards when we did it, we sat with the students and we talked about like, hey, why did that happen? And like, basically the government group all gave, all gave themselves a vaccine and didn't give it to anybody else. And then the media yeah. found out and then there's chaos and protests. And we just dissected it. And ultimately, I think there's a lot of empathy that came from that where it's like, hey, it's hard and people get selfish. And, you know, and so having those opportunities to talk through where everything can go wrong and how to overcome that, because ultimately, like the virus is thriving while we're acting like children. And so I think that's like my goal, right? To get us to get an understanding of why this happens, how does it happen, and what do we do to stop it from happening? Yeah, so I want to come back to that point. And I'll go on record to say that rather than making money, I would support this. I would put money into it. I think it's a fabulous idea. But I think there's two sides to it, two big sides. Um, and as a person that's been in the kind of UIX experience for many years, it's taught us a couple of things about anything. First of all, gamification is a powerful concept whether it's macro yep. or micro. So you've described a macro and that's, 
how do you help kids you know, nurture their mindset so that they understand the world ahead of them? And it's changing. And we try to do our best to be free from bias, to protect them of things, but to give them a grounded understanding so they can build on it. That is powerful. And I would devote all my energy to trying to get that right. The localized approach, the micro, is that when you think of gamification to train behavior, so once you have early belief, even down to how do they respond as a school, how do kids react in a pandemic, how do they not take the path of conspiracy? So all the things you just mm -hmm. mentioned a minute or two ago, the other one that was I would just add to it is that you might have put it under the word mad or crazy, is you get these wild conspiracies, and some of them are hard, to but you get them out of paranoia if, because of well, the is, delay of, of information. You see why we're, you're messing around waiting for governments to sort this information out Shh, and they're making sure. other decisions for political, economical reasons. Do you know what I mean? They, that's where the conspiracies start because people don't have a truth. Do you know what I mean? They don't have a resource that they can trust. But, but also, it, but also it, uh, uh, moreover, from 20, 30 years ago, is that there are greater propagation mechanisms like technology, right? The internet wasn't the internet, right? Facebook didn't exist. So now mm. we've crowned queens and kings and everyone's got a point of view. And so, so be it. I mean, this is the, the world we live in. But it makes it even more important to recognize where are the authenticated data sources? Mm -hmm. you know, where's, what's the baseline of understanding as we go through life? And so I think gamification is so, um, as long as there's belief in the beginning, that you start with some belief, um, you can train localized behavior. Now, obviously, you want to train the right kind of localized behavior, but, but you can help kids to say, I know how to respond, as opposed to just teaching them about culture or about the world we live in today or about family values or about how to teach each other, how to collaborate. All these things are important, but I just think this, that's a fabulous idea. Uh, is the game available online? Yeah. Yeah, you can just download it on like, yeah, the sort of Google or, or Apple or any of those, uh, you know, stores and stuff. Yeah, so you can you can download it, you can play it with friends, you can do... Could do, you do uh, like a, could you simplify it to work on, I don't know, the, you know, like a Facebook game? Do you know what I mean? Like a, uh, where it just works, you know, like it comes up in your feed background? and you just play it. Yeah, could you, like, yeah, something like that, can... and then you play it and it's just like... I don't know, and people. I feel like people would share it, man. Especially with some of the more wackier outcomes, like that would be, say, like your strap line on the top could be like, uh, I don't know, uh, how to stop your neighbor uh, attacking you during a pandemic outbreak <laughs> or something like that. I don't know. And then yeah. that, I would play I mean, that game, and I then would, all of a sudden, I've learned what to do. <laughs> really cool, and you see all of these interactions. Like we're writing up a paper right now from a lot of the simulations we ran because it gives you such really interesting data. Like you know how like you think. How people are like, oh, I have like five contacts, I'm fine. But then mm -hmm. there's like these memes where it's like what you think your bubble is, what your bubble actually is. Well, in the sure. game, because of the game, you actually know what your bubble is. And so we're, we're, we're giving people these stats back of like your first degree contacts and then your like second degree contacts. And it gets kind of bananas afterwards because you're in, you're in touch with yeah. that one guy that's in touch with everybody. And it's like, so you actually have a lot of exposure. But uh, there's all these things like we in the game, we have it where you there's you can get a mask, you can get vaccinated, you can get you get these diagnostics that you pay chips for. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, we also have these beacons that are a place that's just like shooting out virus that you could have. So there's a <laughs> lot of it, it, it. As we added it up, there's like, I mean, the kids go bananas. It's a pretty, it's a pretty wild, fun game. Um, and we had to modify a little bit during COVID, but, um, but we think it's actually is something that are like is entertaining people. They get fired up and they would participate. One of the simulations we ran, we ran it on Halloween weekend. Mm -hmm. at, at one of the colleges that we were working with, Colorado Mesa. And the it was one of the administrators was like, I have a feeling kids are going to party over Halloween weekend. So this would be a good time to kind of figure out, to kind of work with them. And they did. What was not surprising is they totally partied. Like if you look at the stats, there's like these huge clusters of people interacting till like four in the morning. But mm -hmm. um, what was what was actually surprising is they downloaded an app and chose to be, you know, tracked by Bluetooth while doing this. Um and then, and then by the end of how, like by Tuesday, there was a massive outbreak on the campus, like a real outbreak on the campus. Yeah. And yeah. what we thought was kind of neat is that actually like you could be playing this game where you're trying to like stop getting infected by this virtual virus. But then if a real virus spread, you could switch over and then like use that to like, you know, yeah, get exactly. a disease detective, like figure it all out, you know? Um, so mm -hmm. it definitely builds empathy. I remember uh, slightly off topic, but there was a Wired article years ago talking about uh, the economy of Uber when it was first like kicking off and all the controversy around it. And they part of the features they had a game as 
a day as an Uber driver and uh, you play the game, you make trips and it, it shows the difficult, the way, uh, the difficulty of life as an Uber driver mm. and like how hard they have to work to actually, and the way that Uber exploits, um, you know, uh, your hours and perhaps makes you drive unsafely because you've worked 20 hours to get to a certain level and they gamify all. And by the end of it, I have empathy on level another level. So the, the gamifying a scenario definitely works. It sounds super exciting. And I just want to point out to the listener or the viewer that we're not investors. We just love this subject. <laughs> right? No, but I was just thinking like, imagine how powerful if you got, um, you know, you got this message into the hands of people uh, like someone like Dua Lipa or, you know, people that, that on front of culture that yeah. take an interest in the world and, um, you know, the, these are touch points for young people. Do you know what I mean? And if they, it will, it will get looked at. And I, I just think it will just break down the the noise that you have around all this stuff. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that's one thing I know, cause I, I don't, but I'll tell you, I, I'm the kind of person I get a lot of everything I say, I get a lot of blowback. I, so you guys are like my people, but I definitely like, there are a lot of there's a lot of rooms where the doors shut when I say anything like that. Like yeah. I remember, so, you know, I, I giving a talk about talking about how we can empower the youth, and somebody just blew back at me and they're like, "You you think that the youth can be trusted? Like, what mm. are you talking about? That's so irresponsible and all this kind of stuff." And I was like, "What? Like, what are we talking about here? Like, we're literally going to trap an entire generation in their homes and then act like clowns and do a terrible job and spend money t- like." It, I'm 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 like I'm mortified uh, to be like an adult in this setting in the way that we've handled it, and I was, and I basically when I would have these conversations back with them. I would say, look, let's say the kids don't do anything useful, but we'd actually ignite them and electrify them. Like we sent them back into schools or didn't, but if we did, we sent them back into schools wearing masks six feet apart. And in a lot of schools I talked to never once talked to them about COVID. Like it was sort of like, they didn't even talk about it. It was just yeah. these rules and you follow them and you shush. And now we're going to do Chaucer. And I was like, people learn the best. I have, um, I'm, a, I'm an MD, mm-hmm. but I, like, I had a very serious accident where I shattered my pelvis in both my knees. I tell you, I learned everything I learned about medicine. Like in, like I learned so much more as a patient where you really understand the connectivity of things. And so when the stakes are really high and really personal, it's an incredible opportunity to teach. Mm -hmm. And I was like, forget, even if they don't actually do anything that useful, you would be teaching an entire generation about genetics Mm -hmm. and diagnostics and statistics. And like, and they would feel like it matters and that they matter. Mm -hmm. Um, And I don't understand why we didn't do that. Like that, that to me was just such a wasted opportunity where it was a less than year when it could have easily been a more than year. Mm -hmm. They really could. and, And the school's like, and the, I was really proud of the work we did at Colorado Mesa because the students, they set up wastewater testing. They did the detection. The nursing students did all the collections themselves. Like it was honestly, it was, and then they made a bunch of music videos, which Jack would enjoy. Like they, made, they just kept writing songs and making music videos about, you know, social distancing. But they're they're pretty good, actually. Um, and so they took the whole year and they made it a collective like Let's go. go. Um, yeah. and, and they showed, they showed what was possible. That's why I didn't mind. I didn't want to be on the world stage. I wanted to be in Grand Junction, mm-hmm. Colorado, working with a small group of people thinking big, you know, in a small place. I thought that to me was like much more powerful. It was powerful for sure. And you know what, Padis, without moving on, that sounded very believable. Easily said when you're already named in the time 100 and you've already got all these accolades, <laughs> but you, it sounded incredibly honest and cre- inc- did, did you not think? Did you not see that? Uh, I really believe you, you know, don't care about it. I don't think you do. I think you'd rather be out in the field. I, the problem well, is they've got you now. Well, the funny thing is, though, like even there, that, I mean, the, so the obviously very nice. I'm very grateful for time and that, mm-hmm. that credit. But that credit, I mean, that credit came because I was in Kenema, Sierra Leone, right? That credit comes when you are, like, I always talk about this idea that success does not come by, by searching for success. Success comes from going to a place you care about and investing in that place. Mm. And like everything, the, every major success I had was through some sort of intimate decision. Like actually that whole Colorado Mesa thing ended up being in this like big, massive article in the New York Times. And it looks as if I'm like searching for this, but it's like, no, magic happens where you're supposed to be, where you're, you know, where you are. Where yeah, you're, for sure. I'm, I'm a little bit embarrassed to have gotten a time, you know, uh, accolade for, um, for basically in Ebola when it was a massive tragedy and people died. Like that's not mm. something to be proud of. What I'm proud of is the fact that it means my team was credited. The actual accolade of the time was that we shared our data. That was why we got it. Basically, when the outbreak hit, we generated 
really quickly, 99 genomes is the biggest data set around um, by, you know, by, uh, by a long shot. And uh, I went to my, uh, the guy who was leading the project in my team, uh, my, my trainee, Stephen, and I was like, Stephen, I'm like, I, I, I hate to ask you this because I know this is going to make your career, this paper, if we get it, you know, in somewhere important. But I think we just have to make this data available, like now. I was like, every they're on the front lines, like people need to move. Like I cannot wait a day on this data. And I was like, do you mind if I just publish this to the web? And he was like, yes, please do. And the funny thing is, and and by the way, a hundred people were trying to block us from getting anything done, and we were just like, you know, because they thought we were going to get credit. And I was like, screw it, just give it away. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the weird paradox of it was that my accolade came from giving it away. It was a it was such a surprising fact to give away data that they were like, well, that was an unusual twist. Um, and so actually, like when I try to talk to my students, I say, like, do what's in your heart and mm-hmm. hopefully it comes. And if it doesn't, you don't feel bad about it. You didn't at least you weren't chasing some sort of false idol. Right. You did what was the right thing to do. And if that worked out, that's great. And if it didn't, you at least can like sleep at night. I, 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 I just think that the the right decision can often lead to positive impact and positive benefit and you, it's it's just struggling to get people to make the right decisions um yeah. you know so generally when they feel right in your heart um you know yeah. that's generally going to be a good thing than trying to not be transparent go out with a certain strategy you know maybe maybe we're, we're looking at a byproduct of recognition all of a sudden you've diluted the value of what you're doing and you you, you spoke from your heart you thought it made sense you wanted to get uh, this information out there you wanted it to have the greatest impact lo and behold people recognize that? Um, I think I always did. Um, I probably always did. Uh, yeah, I think like, I mean, to be honest, like, you know, the, I said, I, I studied lots of fever because it was interesting. Like every place I would go, I, that's the kind of surprising thing. I, I think I get lucky in that I see things that are uh, like, I, I've always seen things where I'm like, this is important and like this needs to happen like early. Um, but usually like I left the field of human genetics just when the human genome project was done because I was like, my sense was like, this is covered. Mm-hmm. I don't need to do this anymore. So then I went studying last of fever. And so everywhere I go, there's like a start where I like give up on like a good opportunity to go somewhere else. Um, and frankly, like I don't think I'm I'm really supporting a lot of my trainees to go off and do work in pandemics because I have a feeling it's going to be covered soon. I don't really need to stay here. Um, mm-hmm. So I have a, I have my eye on a couple other crazy projects, but I like going to places where I feel like there's a need and it's not been met. Is it your so we're I think Jax and I relate to this hugely. Uh, we're mavericks, right? In fact, what's defined my career is that part of it is that I've been single-minded about things that I truly am passionate about, but they've not always mm-hmm. conformed with business culture or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. And it seems to me that you've got a bit of a maverick personality. And as much that you're going to find the things and you're going to speak up. Um, and also there's, there's always that bit of, well, I got to find a job. I got to find the next thing that is actually makes sense, right? Where do I, where do mm-hmm. I spend my time? And then luckily for you, there's always another virus around the corner that requires, there's always something big that requires great minds to look at, right? Like Las Fever, or Ebola, you know, Zika or something else that's out there. Are you a maverick? Yeah. Um, I, if you call a maverick, somebody who is oblivious to external drivers, yeah, yes. You know, like <laughs> I've always been, okay. I was like, I was the, I was the little girl that moshed in the mosh pit, you know, and played football with the guys, even though all the girls gave me weird looks. I remember, I remember like one moment, a friend of mine who's now a good friend of mine, but I remember I was like, I came back from playing football, like on the, you know, during lunch. And I was like, and this group of like very popular girls are all looking at me and they're like, you're playing football. And I was like, yeah, 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 you should come play. It's like really, really fun. It's super fun. And they're like, yeah, girls don't do that. You know, and uh, and that that was just, that was always me. I think I was always the girl that um, did, you know, I also was the girl who loved math and like really got excited about math. And it just didn't dawn on me that that was not a good thing to talk about if you wanted to have friends, (laughs) but um, it worked out. You know, I think it's one of those things where um, I, it's so maverick uh, maybe is one version. Oblivious might be another version, but I like what I like and it doesn't really matter. It's a powerful character trait because to, to even to say I like what I like is difficult. You know, mm-hmm. um, sometimes Martin touched on it momentarily there where you're kind of like, you might feel like you do something for the purpose of business or trying to get on in the world or for, for you know, because society tells you it's better to go for financial remuneration over something, just following what you like to do. And eventually that will result as long as it's something of importance, which is what where viruses are super important. So it's hard to do. It's admirable nonetheless. So hats off to you, mate. 
Mm-hmm. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. So do you remember where you were when you heard, you know, Wuhan and then you heard coronavirus and you thought, oh, and this, this might actually start to travel? Yeah. So, I, you know, I can't, there can't, like with Ebola, I, I certainly remember like a lot of the details of that. With with SARS, is a little bit different. Like, I mean, I remember when it came on our radar and, and when my lab was like, hey, we're going to get, you know, diagnostics going for this. And we did. It was a little bit more of a slow roll. I think we were there at the very outset. Like we heard about it, the first cases. We're always Was manning that in December or January? That was like, it was definitely by January. We, we were already working on so it. January so January 2020. Yeah. yeah, January 2020. Uh, so we were already working on it. So it was already in my consciousness. But it was it was kind of like in the context of what we always do. If a new virus pops up and we think it could travel, we just make sure that we have surveillance capacity for it. Um, and we were sort of setting all that stuff up. And then and I know because I, I, like there's a punctuated moment for me because um, time asked me to write a piece about it. I think in, I think it was in January of 2020 or in February. Mm-hmm. And I wrote about it. And wh- what I wrote about it then was I said, Hey, there's this virus. There's nothing too unusual about it. Um, it like it what you know, it's um, uh, it's a coronavirus and coronaviruses make up the majority of our seasonal colds. Um, it looks like it, the fatality rate is a little higher than usual, but um, and uh, and so that's not great. And it and it's moving fast like a coronavirus does. So that's not great. That combination is not great. Um, and I said that I. In that article, I said that what, what one of the things that is unusual is that we caught it so fast that we have data pretty fast after it emerged and and we can get that data out there. And in that same article, I said, but it only is going to work if we actually set up diagnostic capacity and move as a global community immediately. And mm-hmm. if the virus doesn't mutate, which it can. And so, um, uh, which I, again, I got blowback for saying that, but I remember like fighting and saying like I wanted in um, because I think that's an important point. And mm-hmm. so it ended up, but that, so... To me, I think it was that slow roll where in, indeed the virus did mutate. That D614G mutation that popped up in February made it really ramped it up. And so it so it, it was um, there wasn't any particular moment uh, uh, that was for us the big thing. It was just the constellation. And when I talk about the virus, I say it's it's the constellation of things. It wasn't even even the fact that there's asymptomatic spread. That's obviously a big, terrible thing. But that's even something we knew can happen. Like all of these things have turned this into like something we understand, but it's not something we didn't know before that we've seen plenty of asymptomatic cases and other viruses. And indeed that, you know, that Operation Outbreak game that I was telling you about uh, before COVID hit, um, Andreas had um, run a bunch of simulations of um, where he set the virus that the kids were being infected with as a SARS-like virus that has a massive asymptomatic spread. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so we, it's always like, we we're like, whoa, like you got that. But, and people always think that's surprising that we thought to make a virus that does exactly what SARS-CoV-2 does. And what I say is it's just, it's not, it's what you'd expect and you, what you'd expect to make something bad. Um, but yeah, I mean, and that's the thing is, uh, other thing I also like to tell people to just keep in mind is we keep talking about it as like, uh, humans, we like our phrases. And when we have our phrases, we stick to them as if they're somehow truth. Religious and so, truth. We, yeah, well, we've described this thing as a once in a century outbreak. And we keep describing, you know, keep saying it's a once in a century outbreak. And I'm like, stop saying that. Like, uh, like no it could be a once. Yeah, it could be a once in a year outbreak. Like, we don't know. Like, this isn't mm. the biggest thing. This is not. And, and that's sort of like why my own view of the virus is a little bit weird, because this is not the worst virus we could get. And it's not the virus mm. we'd work out. And when I hear about the like lab leak theories and all of that, which I stay out of, cause I don't, um, I don't have a truth opinion, but I was like, if I was to design a virus, it wouldn't be this. Like this is, yeah. this is not that bad. But how know, does it, this stack up to like Ebola, for example, in your eyes? I think that it, I mean, I think that it's, it's, it's obviously can cause a much bigger impact than Ebola because of the fact that it spreads so easily and mm-hmm. has a really this like rich asymptomatic spread. Um, but obviously, I, if you were to ask me which one would I want to get, it would definitely be COVID over Ebola, right? Mm-hmm. It's that if, if Ebola picked up, and that's also possible, right? All these viruses can change. If Ebola picked up a little bit more easy, easy transmission, uh, then it becomes Ebola. So I think oh, yeah. all of these viruses have the potential to pick up one or two or three modifications that make it a whole different ballgame. And then when you add on to that the possibility that somebody is either developing such a drug such a disease or or will would intentionally spread it then then we're 
you know, then we're in real trouble. It was interesting to hear Redfield, Robert Redfield, you know, the former director of the CDC. You know, he came out and said after you know, he left the post that he thinks it's quite possible that this was being cooked up um, and that it just by mistake, you know, it wasn't necessarily by a warfare, it just perhaps it just got out. Um, and whatever the reason there was for good research purposes that they were, they were developing this. Um, that seems probable. Uh, I'm interested in, 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 in whether you think those things are probable for any country to participate in and the fact that workers have to do this research, whether it is to find therapies or vaccines, and that they put themselves at risk in these hard jobs and that they could actually mm. become carriers when they leave their place of work and it just, that's how it happens. Something as benign as that. So obviously the kind of the lab leak theory has become really radioactive and very um, religious in nature. And my former postdoc, Christian Anderson, is sort of in the heart of it. So I, you know, um, he published a paper. He, he was the one that published a paper um, that said on the proximal origin of SARS-CoV-2, where he believes it proposed with other experts that it was natural origin. Um, but then he also was the one whose email to, to Tony Fauci was leaked, where he said, you know, this is interesting and it's not totally clear that this is um, natural and I want to investigate it. And so he's become this like hot button character. But then when you sort of dissect everything he said in that email and in the paper, it's, it's really, uh, I think, is actually what shows you what science is, right? Science is a thing where you actually do pose both questions. He did, like, when you look at it, I'm very right. proud of him because right. he essentially said, hey, I'm looking at this and there's something about this that seems a little different. I'm going to investigate it, Tony, and I'm going to go see what, you know, what I see. And he kept an open mind, I, you know, in looking at it. But the more he investigated, the more he looked, it just seemed clear. All of everything that we're seeing here is what we see in nature. It looks a lot like viruses we see in animals. There's nothing, not like everything that even possibly could be unusual. Like there's this kind of this, Furing cleavage site you may have heard about that's like a hot button issue, but also seen in other viruses like this. It looks a lot like SARS-CoV. Um, and so in the end, he he did. He did a deep dive, a thorough investigation, and nothing in it seemed unusual. And even though, like, I think one of the ways he said it, and I liked it, was that all things are possible, but not everything is equally likely. The more he looked at every possibility, it just didn't seem likely that um, that this came from a lab leak. And one thing, and so I said, I'm not, I'm not ruling it out. I don't want to say anything in that. And I, and I definitely don't want to, I think we really do a disservice where we talk, where we talked about the other people as like crackpot or conspiracy theorists. Like, no, there oh. are people that really want to know. And there's answers, questions that should be asked and answered. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think when you were talking before about the politicians and all that, the danger of a lot of this stuff is that, that the, the scientists or the politicians get into this place where they dismiss you know, uh, any yeah. objection to what they're doing. And that doesn't help. Like you have to be open to be like, it's possible. I totally effed up, like totally possible, totally plausible. Let's go look, let's go find out. And so but I think Christian was doing that. He should just find out like, what does this look like? And the one thing, one of the biggest things that people use to think that this was a lab leak that I just want to demystify a little bit is, isn't it too much of a coincidence that the like this strain came from Wuhan in a place where they are studying these viruses, right? And like that has been this huge thing where they say, isn't that a coincidence? I'm like, no. In fact, why is it that every variant comes out of the UK? Do you think the UK is like developing variants like at a higher rate than anywhere else? No, it's the UK variant because the UK was the first to capture it. It's the mm -hmm. Wuhan virus because the Wuhan was the first to capture it. It's a very high likelihood this virus didn't come from Wuhan, didn't mm -hmm. show up and jump into humans from well, like we don't know where it came from. We just know what where we saw it, and we saw it where we. It's the kind of idea that you only see fires like where there's fire detectors. Like that's not true. You, you, <laughs> you catch the fire when you hit a fire detector. That's how it works. But and the second point about uh, how else it could have been developed, like poor old animals. Well, it's not. Yeah, it's not just the poor old animals. Like this is one of the interesting things. Like. I've debated, um, so I'm always, you know, have be, I'm always that one with the um, unpopular opinion. But well before the Ebola outbreak, I would fight with people about the fact that humans might be the reservoir for these things. And you know, there's such a thing as typhoid Mary, and like, could it be that like everyone's trying to figure out because no one could ever figure out what the reservoir for Ebola was? And I was like, what if humans are the reservoir? And they're like, well, that's not possible. Right. We've never seen it. I'm like, have you ever looked? Have you ever looked at a human? You don't know. Like, you may have it. You don't know. I mean. And, you know, during the Ebola outbreak, 
there were lots of um, there were lots of instances of people who were these like long carriers of of Ebola and uh, and like this one study we looked at where somebody had it you know uh, for uh, I think in our study it was about over a hundred days where they had it actively replicating uh, in their body but not having any effect. Uh, in other studies, they showed it years, you know, like over a year after infection. And so it, the, this idea, it's not that animals are giving it. It's just that viruses are hiding everywhere. And what we should get better at is just seeing them and then seeing if any of them, you know, like analyzing enough and characterizing enough so that we're well positioned to pick up a, a new one. And then looking to see if they do anything differently. Like you need to know that we also viruses are everywhere. Like anywhere you turn, there's a virus. You know, we, we're all probably carrying some number of viruses now. Um, they're usually not doing anything too bad. And every once in a while, they switch. And what we need to do is just pick up the switch when it happens. I argue yep. that right now, what we did in the United States was way more than we did way more testing than we needed to do because mm-hmm. we didn't test smartly. What we did instead oh, is like we spent we spent. You know, we ran a million tests on the NFL, um, testing them every single day and millions of tests on college students, testing them every day. We mm-hmm. wasted so many tests. Like if we just uh, I, I published um, this other paper that essentially it's called the case for altruism and t- diagnostic testing. And it talks about how in any outbreak, um, the, the natural tendency is to become selfish, right, to protect yourself. And like, I'm, you know, the Kardashians are going to test themselves 100 times before going on vacation, where it's like if they had taken those tests and just used it for their neighbors, they mm. actually would have protected themselves more and they would have done a good deed. And so ultimately, like it's actually a less vast effort. It's a smart effort, which sometimes mm. seems like a lot of work. Um, we could just be much smarter in the way we do the testing and it doesn't require as much spending or um, or or work. I think the, 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 the problem with, with process improvement is when you've got time urgency or panic um what we do is we throw money at it it's a bit like uh, business in growth grow 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 and then you know, then you look back and you think oh my god i can't grow any further because we're not efficient so then we start to think smart and in an ideal yeah. world the visionaries uh, are looking at the data or they've got an instinct and they go and you know they have the eureka <laughs> moment and they think smart up front unfortunately most of the world doesn't work like that including medicine right it's, it's a, we tend to go after something because we have to and then we look back and say did you know we could have yeah. done this a lot smarter well i mean <laughs> what would you what would you say doctor about um like how the america was prepared for a pandemic in that sense what what preparations were in place previous to this yeah i mean not not obviously like it, it rolled back the the kind of the the what is it the you know the, the scene and it showed that we no, were not yeah, yeah. very well and most of the people who who participate in outbreaks um knew that we weren't like we knew that things were being shared on fax machines and that we had a system you, you know the uk where you are right now like is was much better prepared because of the fact that it had a national health service you know services and that means it's organized across everything is on a group like Everything is coordinated and communicated across the country. Um, things could be rolled out on a national scale. I remember listening to a Times podcast. I'm not shouting out their podcast. It's terrible. But no, I'm joking. The, uh, um, there's, they did uh, a chronological evaluation of the events of uh, the coronavirus over here. And apparently we ran some sort of um, kind of test if we were prepared for a pandemic uh, like in 2015 or 16, but it was, and, but the reason why we pulled the wrong levers is the virus that they prepared for was more like a flu like virus rather than what we had today, which was a much more asymptomatic and much faster transmission rate, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so could, can you ever really be properly prepared? Uh, I, I mean, I think that the bigger issue was not, if they were, if they were, exquisitely prepared for flu they would have been well prepared for this too when mm-hmm. nobody was exquisitely prepared for anything and that's the truth like when there's been a lot of investigations of like the level and and i, I know i can't remember who did the report but it was a big agency and mm-hmm. showed that not a single country on the planet was wow. prepared for a pandemic and, and only five percent right. of countries were moderately prepared for for anything so it was not it wasn't it the nice thing is that the same thing that will stop you know flu from going through your office or, you know, like some random bug going through daycare is the same thing that'll stop 
uh, a massive pandemic from spreading. And so it's not like one of these things where we have to prepare for some hypothetical eventuality. Mm -hmm. The things we put in place to have better diagnostics, better social distancing when needed, better procedures will stop any, you know, infection from spreading. And so that I think and the UK was not greatly prepared and you didn't do great. It's not like I'm saying, you know, it was it was terrific. And, and a lot of that, it's just that they had some things in place that were better organized. Um, but like they had actually downgraded a lot of their sequencing capacity of viruses and kudos to them that they decided to pull that up during the pandemic. But they weren't at the outset. They didn't have that either. So. I think that that's that it was not so much that they were preparing for the wrong virus. It's just that mm. nobody was really prepared for wow. the viral spread. If, this, if one thing COVID has taught us is that our lack of preparation on something that could kill at much vaster amounts than any war could, it would be uh, you know, viruses. And if there is great history to show us that or demonstrate that, and no matter how smart we are, and we are incredibly resilient, right, the human species, that that's there. But the, the you know, and the other one is obviously the environment and that, you know the, any planetary change and what we do to add or, or subtract from it. So climate change, and over a hundred years, well, I guess it's not in real time anymore. I guess it might be a meteor impact. But but you know, at the end of the day, mm. those two things are pretty damn big. So what would you do? What what do you think that scientists and and, and policymakers, and I think of that as just any form of government, um, do differently? to what we're doing right now that could make that better um, for, you know, the next plan on pandemic. And the obvious one I know you're going to say is spend more money because it's ridiculous how little is spent in this area when we think of what we spend on defence in the UK mm. or in America. So that's really mm. obvious. Spend more money, uh, create more facilities, create more outreach, collaborate in the right regions in the world, makes all the sense in the world. But is there anything novel do you think that you'd like to see change? But you're, you're absolutely right. Like, Whenever we kind of write our position pieces on this, we, you know, go through all of the like history and we show, you know, we talk about the fact that essentially um, and pandemics have caused more devastation than any of the historic wars, the Great mm. War, um, and that, you know, and then on an annual basis cause more mortality than uh, like all the modern wars. Um, and so it is kind of, you know, not only just the death toll, but the economic loss from infectious diseases annually is remarkable. Mm. And it's pretty wild, like how the military budget dwarfs this budget, particularly when you think of the fact that this is actually a military crisis, too. Like, and the modern wars are, are very likely to be uh, involved some bio component. I mean, they did back then, and it's much easier to do that now. So, so there should be a big investment into this space. Um, going forward. And the, the thing is, like I, so I said, I don't give them, I, I, I'm, if I was to say, I, I, I lean towards the natural uh, origins of coronavirus. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not, I don't rule out a lab leak theory, but I think that more the, the evidence suggests it's natural. Um, and, and I do believe that's the case. But I think that anybody watching this would say, hey, if I was a bioterrorist, I would say if I wanted to cause a lot of devastation, I, I, I now know how vulnerable yeah, all these yeah. countries are. I don't. I don't. I do believe that somebody's developing something a little bit better and probably more designed for more. So we have to be ready for that. So that's just one thing I would say. And, and so yes. So Martin, I, I would say funding, right? And funding and coordination and yeah. all the, the the right kind of spending of that money. Um. But that's sort of like so the kind of I say like the kind of three things that are important to know about infectious diseases as a existential threat to humanity is one, they're a big one, and and that they should be taken very seriously because of the amount of economic loss and life loss they cost. Two, that unlike a lot of these other ones, the the solutions are very, um, they're very, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Just typical. They, they're, they're, mm. There's nothing fancy. We're not developing a Star Wars system and satellite in the earth. It's literally get better diagnosis for your Aunt Janice and you'll be less infected, right? And yeah. Daycare set up. And so the basically the practicality, I guess I would say, the practicality of, Getting better diagnosis for flu is going to prepare you for a pandemic. Tells you that you're not also spending money for a hypothetical. You're spending money for, uh, you know, um, what would be useful right today. And then the third piece I talk about is the fact that, you know, when you talk about like, you know, getting young stu students in America, like young kids in America to vote, you know, 18 year olds mm -hmm. to vote. It's hard to say your vote matters, particularly with an electoral college, right? You're like, please vote. But I don't know why exactly. But, you know, but just vote sure. doesn't matter, you know. Um, or when you try to get somebody to um, recycle, you're like, 
please recycle because it's helpful, but really you're one in 7 billion people on the planet and really what the companies are doing are much worse than you. So, you know, but with a pandemic, the interesting thing is there's an exponential spread. And so one person can literally launch a pandemic and one person can stop a pandemic. So there's no other existential threat in which everyone can be the hero or the villain if in the way that they act. And so yeah, I would just point. say that to that, um, to that point, that's why empowerment matters so much to us, because I think it's not just spending money uh, and getting the technologies out there. It's getting in the hands of people and trusting, working with them collectively towards the solution. I was going to say, were there any decisions uh, that you saw during this pandemic that just did not see right, sit right with you, that you were just like, wow, I cannot believe they did that? Uh, yeah, a lot, I think. I mean, I think... Uh, <laughs> the whole thing! I, no, the, no, I mean, I think there's also a lot of things done right, and you want to take a moment and say, hey, we had some good moments too. You know, we did all right as yeah. a humanity. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, to, I, I think, you know, one example of something that, I, that really made me upset was uh, the way we went to social distancing in this kind of freeze frame. Um, not necessarily like social distancing was needed, but I, I wanted to be clear that this was a blunt instrument that was not being used well. I would like to see in the future, if we have a pandemic, that we don't do this, where like everyone stays still, no one move, and you're trapped in your home with somebody who might be an abuser or, I mean, right, we saw such a rise and we saw a rise in domestic violence, we saw a rise in abuse, we see a rise mm. in, uh, we see a lot of kids left behind. This is unconscionable. Like, I was very upset when the social distancing measures got put in place, um, just because of like, why were we in this place we got to this position? And also just how are we so thoughtless in what we're doing? We're, we don't think well, right? There, like in one of the kind of simple things I was saying is that we suddenly had all of these personal trainers and um, nannies that were all out of work, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we have all these people who are out of shape and, and have ch children that are running around. I was like, something could be done better here. Like we could have made pods earlier. We could mm -hmm. have had. Um, and so, we, you know, I think collectively, if we're going to think that there might be an ever be a scenario in which we're going to hit social distancing again, we should prepare ourselves and say, what are the pods going to look like? How are we going to coordinate ourselves in For a sure. real epidemic? And because also, and, and to remember, this is not a real pandemic. In a real pandemic, you wouldn't have people going to the grocery store and you wouldn't have like people in Florida just touting, flouting all like restrictions. In a real pandemic, we really have to do this the right way. And there are good ways of doing this where we create pods and really say, don't move outside of your pod, but let's have some system by which we make sure it's safe and that sure. everyone has all the needs met within that pod. Like, I, I do think that there's some social engineering process that should get in place to say, in a case of emergency, how do we all interact? <laughs> Hi, mom. <laughs> how, but how would you, when you say a pod, like, what do you envisage? Like, so say, I mean, it was a big thing with domestic violence, for example, and entrapment in homes and stuff. How would, what would a pod look like in a more safer environment? I haven't, I've only thought about this as like a, you know, in my kind of reaction, it's, I have not engineered this whole thing, but so like, I mean, some of the things that, you know, it, well, it's the simple things is like basically you and your neighbor and one other person. And then some, some oh, got you. person that gets brought in that like is now like the nanny who's the caretaker for this street corner. Right. So each street corner is a unit. You try to really like keep it out of that like unit. But, um, but so the thing is, if you do that collectively, um, what you don't want is the anonymity of the whole situation. Like, what, what, what in the school we so when we were working in the school in Colorado we had something there there the Maverick is their um is their mascot and so mm -hmm. they had uh, Maverick families their Mavely they had a Mavely of like eight people they were with and the idea is it's a collective unit where we're all responsible for each other and very non anonymous like you are responsible and so like within that they had to kind of tell each other and share with each other where their social contacts they protect each other and so. Can we create a thing where it's like these little, these different pods mm -hmm. truly are um, responsible to one another and say, okay, if we want to keep seeing each other and being around, we have to actually then be safe. That what you're describing is powerful for one very reason. If we have, to, if there was a reason to put more money into this area, into researching, how do we deal with epidemics? How do we deal with pandemics? Um, you have to look at the whole workflow or the whole life cycle, and what, and, and so, in, like you said, in the in the in the heat of the moment, there's very little learning being done. It's reactionary. So if it's all mm -hmm. reactionary, well, we're going to be disorganized. We're going to be panicking. 
we're going to be emotional. Collectively, we may not form our greatest work. Upon reflection or 2020, we may do a better job. You widen that, it becomes even harder because this stuff is protracted. But actually, this thing called solution deployment, where the pods sit, right, where what do we do, that requires time and money. And then you think Mm. about how do you create the best way to execute something really fast? Well, that's now, now you're talking it's months and years. And, and mm-hmm. you can then share best practice across the world. You kind of need that. It's like, how do you deal for, how do you tackle a nuclear attack, right? Well, you could build a nuclear shelter. Well, we need some kind of solution deployment, but it sits in a much wider life cycle. Um, and it seems to me that, that, that um, dare I say, that's not even in, in anyone's real thinking. They've gone and created the first kind of web of this because it largely didn't affect anyone that's alive today. Right, you know, there were things mm. that happened when there wasn't technology. So it's almost like we, we, it feels as if we've started from the beginning and now we're starting to see, and you're starting to point um, and I completely share the view that you've got to have, you know, you've got to be better organized. You've got to have some kind of plan. But it sounds like, um, you know, where we talk about um, military stuff where people are investing, there's privatization within it, there's people making money within it. And obviously there's people making money on the uh, uh, pharmaceutical sides of medicine and all everywhere you go. And that drives this kind of progress and culture changes and all this kind of stuff. And they, whether it's lobbying or et cetera, et cetera. Right. And that's why I think the work you're doing, what we were talking about at the start with the, uh, on localized level on an education level and stuff like that. I think with, a, the right type of partnership whether it's with a uh, in a privatized way or something like that to spread that kind of culture because I, that someone needs to do the work and it's not going to come from on a political on a government level do you know what i mean because it's it's just too far it takes too long to get the benefits isn't it yeah definitely i mean and and i think that's it's it's always trying to figure out like how do you infuse good things like knowing that we're all working within a capitalistic mm. uh society and there's all these things how do you you, you have to sort of think what flows, what's going to flow in what's that. Gonna, yeah. Um, and it, it, it's, it's tricky, right? Like I think at the end of the day, the solution will be coming from, so people always ask me, well, how do we like before the, this pandemic um, in particular, but also after, like, how do we get, how do we get this to work? Like, why would anybody ever use it? And I'm like, well, in my mind, when I think about it, I'd say I'd go to something like, you know, uh, like, one of the oil companies or the mining companies or the Amazons of the world. Mm -hmm. And you develop a product that works for them that says, Hey, I know all you care about is your bottom line and you want to make sure that your workforce is always working hundred percent. So why don't we develop diagnostics that will track infections in your workforce and we'll stop a a single infection. So I I think you always have to speak to people's, for sure. um, You know, self-interest. Um, and explain to them the sort of the economics of it that works for them. So I think we will come to solutions when we can come to a, a very concrete deliverable on how it saves their bottom line. You, I thought what your suggested innovation was going to be that, you know, we should that we should use the amazing Amazon delivery network to roll out vaccines <laughs> or whatever. And they turn up. That, that was a meme for a minute, though. The Amazon they give you an delivery vaccine. I'll be taking the Amazon vaccine on Prime. Yeah, yeah. Moving on to a couple other quick things here because it would be remiss, and I hate covering things that everyone else is talking about, but there seems to be not enough education, and it can't come from people that just want to do the right thing. It needs to come from respected people like you that that have an opinion um, and have spent time thinking about it or or had a more considerate, uh, considerate view. So when it comes to getting a vaccine, you've got a bunch of conspiracy theorists. I'm interested in your view how do you say to people that don't want to get vaccinated uh, how would you how would you how do you view it yourself yeah i would say obviously that, that it's another you know radioactive topic um and one but one but an important dive, one right well right and i was gonna say yeah, one we need to dive into right i was vaccinated and i encouraged you know, everyone i love to be vaccinated but i don't impose it on people because sure. I, it, it's, it is there's a bit of a personal choice and and frankly the medical establishment has not done a good enough job to earn the trust, mm-hmm. right? That That's yeah. the real fair problem. Point. Fair. We have this terrific technology that really does work. And it's a make it thing where like people are vaccinated, everybody's out on the street and yep. and you're not seeing people, the you know horrible fatality rates. I mean, it, it, the, the these vaccines have really shown what vaccines can do. But historically, um, we have been very dismissive whenever issues come up 
Um, and, you know, in some cases we've been dismissive because they're a little bit off, like the, a lot of the Andrew Wakefield work, um, and the early stuff around autism was, I mean, sh- was retracted and should have been retracted. And so I think, uh, right. people who've seen that data are, 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 are kind of, look at it and say, well, this is ridiculous data. And this was clearly a, a, a biased and doctored study. Yeah. And of course, the people who heard about it don't know that. Yep. And so you can't dismiss them outright. Like they heard about a study and you have to stop and say, OK, look, it's an important question. Nobody obviously is going to give vaccines if there's a high likelihood that it would you know, cause autism. But we've done the investigations and here are the studies and we'll go with you. But I think as soon as there's like a whiff in the air of like, I don't want to talk to you about that or you're crazy to think that then people, of course, react. And I, I just think that the medical establishment too quickly has ruled out anybody who's an anti-vaxxer to be just a crackpot uh, or a, a disruptionist is sure. is why we're in the predicament that we're in. Because you know what? I mean, the medical profession has also created the number one cause of death of men under 50 by mm-hmm. shoving fentanyl on, you know, and I recently, like somebody recently, a doctor tried to shove it on me again. I'm like, what is wrong with this situation, right? Like we have... It is really important that we have the highest level of integrity and and we haven't and we haven't had it historically. And also like um, Seth Nukin has a book called The Panic Virus that does a terrific job of both explaining like why the links to autism and vaccines is is kind of is is very unfortunate, not not only because it seems incorrect, but it also is taking away much needed research funds of autism just mm-hmm. going down, perpetuating this one theory where there's a lot of other questions that should be asked. Um, but he also then explains like what led up to this level of distrust. And it had to do with like, there are cases in which sometimes like a vaccine, um, lot would be, it would be, um, contaminated and people did mm. get sick and the vaccine. Oh, wow. I hadn't thought of that. Covered. Yeah. Things, things happen. So I mean, a particular anyway, batch could be like, not, not, not good. Yeah, that, yeah. It has happened in the past. Like there have been things where like a batch or that, or, and then there, there's some low level breakthrough kind of infections that can happen. And so. We're not talking to people about the fact that there are true risks. Um, mm. But ultimately, when you look at it statistically, you know, th- I would rather take my chance with a vaccine than I would with the virus itself. Um, and so anyway, all that to say, I think, what do I say to people? I, 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 I hear them out and I see what their concerns are and I talk to them about it and I try to say why I, I think overall I would use it. And even in my case where I don't necessarily think my risk of COVID is high, um, I, I also took it just mostly because of the other people that, that I'm protecting around me and some of whom can't get vaccinated. Um, and right now yeah. I do it for children. To be honest, for me right now, because of the fact that the virus is still changing and can always change to infect children and they can't get vaccinated, mm-hmm. that's my main sure. reason for doing it. That was like my main drive. Um, is that the, the children have given up their whole lives, their whole year to protect the older amongst us and we should get vaccinated to protect them. 